lots to cover today. Uh, you may have already downloaded the, uh, the PDF of the, uh, the set of slides I'm going to run through. You'll see that there's um, a whole lot of data. It's almost overwhelmingly data. Um, don't panic about that. I'm, I'm not expecting everyone to memorize the data. Um, there is an important thing about what I'm doing today. It's a kind of an overview exercise. Um, what I'll effectively be doing is telling some stories about the data. And uh, this will be recorded. Uh, I was asked about that yesterday. And um, I'll edit that up. I'll edit both of them up over the weekend and put them up. Um, so you can review it if you want to. But don't worry if you don't exactly catch the stories, because the stories I'm going to come back to on, on a number of occasions. When we're talking about different issues, concepts, um, and particular case studies in the course, I'll re keep re-emphasizing various points. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a clue straight away. Um, one of them is the, um, the robustness, the continuing robustness and dynamism of the US economy. Uh, there's um, lots of things about America um, that might trouble foreign observers. Obviously, inequality is a, is a huge one, and we're going to look at some statistics on that. Um, maybe the quality of the political conversation, if anyone actually saw reports or even watched bits of the um, Biden Trump. Um, we won't even call it a, uh, a debate. It wasn't really a debate. It was um, President Trump not being very presidential last night. Um, so a lot of people looked at that have been, been quite dismayed. And uh, this morning, I noticed various people have said, well, this shows that, you know, America's lost its kind of uh, capacity for leadership in the world and whatnot. Um, over the last hundred years, one really important conclusion is that the world has um, routinely, systematically underestimated American dynamism. And we do that at our peril. Um, uh, probably, well, well, I think without doubt, the single largest mistake that Japan has made as a nation in its, in its own history was to assume that because America seems divided and chaotic internally, um, it's incapable of acting in a unified fashion internationally. And uh, that was the tragedy, of course, of World War II and Pearl Harbor. Um, so we always underestimate America at our peril. Um, looking at the survey results here, I think I'll, I'll stop the survey straight away um, because obviously I'm going to influence the results with my, uh, my comments straight away. So let me just screenshot it and then I'll share the results. Excuse me, going off camera a little bit here. I, uh, I have my camera set up smack bang in the middle of my uh, iMac. So I actually have to look around my camera and the tripod it's on to um, use the uh, whole bunch of apps, which I've got down to one side of it. Okay, right. So I'll share the results. Um, the results are pretty much exactly as I expected, actually. Um, so uh, Japan came up at 23% of respondents as the one that's most likely to have a strong recovery and uh, the EU at 44%. Um, and that's interesting. Um, India at uh, 12%, uh, the USA at 18% and Russia at 5%. Um, we'll get into a conversation about this uh, subsequently. I'll, we'll look at data in relation to some places. Let me just say straight up that actually, um, the, hmm, my camera just briefly disconnected, which is worrying. I've got every, pretty much everything turned off. It shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that, but uh, hmm. I'll see how it goes. I may have to reset it if it, if it does that again. Um, pretty much uh, every economist in the, uh, the EU thinks that actually the United States will outperform um, the EU. Um, so the world has high hopes for the EU, um, but very often the EU as a whole tends to disappoint. There are, there are parts of the EU that tend to be uh, stronger, but there's a lot of internal division there. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, there's perpetual hope for India. Um, but India also fairly systematically uh, disappoints those who hold, hold hope for it because it, it's got so much potential. And of course, everyone wishes the best for India, um, but it's, it's a huge place and a uh, long history of state 
you know, socialistic like state intervention. And so um, there's uh, a lot of frustrations with economic policy. Um, we'll see with the USA that um, the USA can be chaotic. Uh, there can be riots in the street um, and yet uh, large sections of the US uh, economy can nonetheless be very dynamic, okay? Um, Russia, not many people hold hopes for Russia. Russia is an interesting one because of its uh, resource dependency and we'll, we'll give considerable discussion to that and what that means. Um, Japan, uh, probably the, the prospects for Japan um, are reasonable, but what we'll see is that for a couple of decades, for some pretty fundamental reasons, Japan's baseline growth outlook is um, modest. And yes, my I just saw the my image is frozen again. Um, bear with me one moment, and this is going to make you seasick. I'm going to check my phone and see if there's an issue here. Excuse me a second. Um, put it into do not disturb mode, turned off every app. Um, so it shouldn't be doing that. Maybe it just doesn't like mornings. Okay. Right. Um, now, first of all, let's, before I forget, uh, let's take attendance. So if everyone can just put a two in the chat feed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'll stop sharing the, uh, the poll results, but the takeaway there is that um, generally folks seem to be pretty uh, pessimistic about America. Um, but what we'll see in the American case is that um, while there are uh, lots of things to be disconcerted about in terms of things like inequality, um, America still has um, a very uh, uh, resilient capacity for economic dynamism. And uh, we saw that with the, uh, the global financial crisis, for example, that uh, the Lehman shock, that although uh, for a while unemployment rates were truly horrendous because American companies are very quick to sack people, that actually uh, rates of rehires of people returning uh, to employment, very often at lower incomes, unfortunately, um, but returning to employment were actually very, very rapid. Um, one of the other really striking things is the acceptance of so many Americans um, about the need for flexibility. And if we look at statistics on how many people in America during their careers actually move substantial different uh, distances, you know, across across state borders, right across the continent, for example, to uh, to take better career opportunities. Um, that's very much ingrained in um, American culture. There's a remarkable degree of acceptance of that um, in contrast to parts of Europe where a lot of people don't move. And so we see um, systematic uh, patterns of long-term structural unemployment in regions in Europe while there are labor shortages in cities. So the, the most, one of the most extreme cases is the UK we have got people who don't leave northern towns, for example, um, and uh, long-term unemployed, uh, while um, a large proportion of jobs in uh, new jobs that are created in London are filled by foreigners, for example, who came through the, uh, the EU. And <coughs> excuse me, that helps to explain some of the politics of Brexit, but there are also cultural elements there about um, hesitancy of people to move. Um, but there are also structural elements as well too, to, to move from a lower cost location to a very expensive place like, uh, like London, obviously um, is challenging. So we'll talk about um, what underpins labor market flexibility. Um, a final thing on this, <coughs> excuse me, everything's going wrong, okay? A final thing on this is that um, uh, if you've been to, for example, San Francisco, you'd know that uh, some of the most dynamic places in the world. We've said probably San Francisco is of all the destinations in the world, and we'll talk significantly about place in this course and, and concentration of economic activity. One of the most striking things about San Francisco, you, know, you go there, is that it's, it's simultaneously its affluence and its rates of homelessness. Um, there's a lot of kind of nimby, what we call nimbyism, not in my backyard, kind of um, views about things like building public housing and whatnot. And so we tend to see very high rates of homeliness, homelessness, not homeliness, homelessness um, in um, San Francisco, even though it's a strikingly uh, democratic, uh, very liberal uh, city in other ways. Okay, so let's do a dive into the uh, data. And uh, there is uh, a, few, uh, 
a couple of broader lessons from what we're going to do today. And that is that, uh, first of all, we shouldn't be afraid of data. Uh, many of you are kind of Bunke students, um, have a almost allergic reaction to maths. If you don't, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but it's, even if you're, you're not good at the maths, you don't need in any way to be afraid of statistics um, because there's on the one hand, the generation of statistics and of course the mathematical manipulation of them. But most of what we do in terms of making sense of statistics is actually super low level maths. It's, it's more about, um, if anything, just simply learning to use um, spreadsheets and in particular, um, data visualization techniques. So these are not really maths issues so much as more interface issues with learning software, using software to be able to do it. But also even if you, if you don't do that, um, the interpretive dimension is something that anyone um, with a liberal arts kind of background um, who may be very much just in the humanities um, can uh, still be very uh, comfortable with. And uh, there is an inescapable truth in any organization, whether you go to go to work for a company, the public sector, an NGO, in any meeting, the person who can best appear, I won't say do, but who can best appear to make sense of statistics will win any argument. So if you're afraid of numbers, and afraid of conversations about numbers, you're going to be in an incredibly weak position in any kind of meeting. So uh, you should very much get in the habit in any, when you're in any organization of going straight to the statistics, reading the statistics, trying to find your own stories, and in particular, um, be ready to try and challenge the convenient interpretations of statistics that other people use, okay? Um, and a lot of people, they, they have a bit of a kind of a brain freeze when they're confronted by numbers. Uh, so two types of people win out. Either people have generally got um, a good statistical sense or people who can just shamelessly tell lies at their own convenience. Unfortunately, Donald Trump is in the latter category. He just uh, follows that old adage that a lie repeated enough becomes the truth. He just repeats and repeats and repeats. And if people challenge him, he just simply says fake facts. Okay. And he should know he is the, uh, the master of fake facts. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's jump into some numbers. Um, but before, before we do that, I just want to emphasize one really basic thing. Um, indeed, I was tempted to call this course varieties of capitalism. Uh, there is actually a book, though, that quite explicitly has that title, and I was a little bit worried that uh, it would imply that I would use that book as a text because it's it's okay, but it's an academic text and it would bore students uh, very much. It's also too expensive. But uh, I want to emphasize this notion that there is enormous variation in terms of what we think of capitalist societies, or um, I actually much prefer the term market-based societies uh, because we'll see the capital... Capital in itself is inherently definitionally problematic, and we'll talk about this. It's like human cap capital, um, you know, knowledge-intensive resources. So, do we talk about knowledge as a knowledge as capital, for example, culture as capital, and uh, that's a, that's a kind of endless discussion. Uh, the alternative is to use a much narrower definition of capital in terms of basic economics or a Marxian definition. And I, and I think all of those things bring their ideological biases. So my preference is to talk about market systems, variety of market systems, but let's stick with capitalisms for the moment. Uh, the really important point is really during the Cold War, people tend to think of capitalism versus communism. And that tended to distract from the fact that there was enormous variation across market systems and that um, a society that might be very open to the world economy, uh, that might very much follow market-based principles, uh, will nonetheless have the state involved in doing some things and regulating some things. All societies have this. Alternatively, societies that um, may be seen to be relatively more towards, say, I won't say communist, but social democratic, uh, where the state's heavily involved, nonetheless might have a tradition of private provision, companies uh, providing things that in other places are understood to be something that's exclusively uh, done publicly you know, by uh, state actors. For example, France has a long tradition of private water companies uh, 
um, providing the water. And in the Anglo world, traditionally, water was something that was provided as, as kind of public infrastructure. So it was considered a strange thing to think about having, a, for example, a private post office or a private water system. And uh, in the last 20 to 30 years, we've seen much more embrace of uh, more fluid models. And um, so it's pretty much up for grabs, you know, what in turn each society and each sector, is it going to be state provided, state regulated, or is it going to be private provided, free competitive market or private provision in a strictly controlled way by government? Um, so in a way, because policy options are so wide and there's so much debate about what policies work well, uh, we find that uh, there's much more recognition that we have lots of varieties of capitalism. Now, among social systems themselves, um, there was considerable variation. And in the, the later years of communism, the late 1980s and the early 1990s, one of the interesting scholarly turns was to look at actually how the better working communist systems had many features of market systems kind of behind the scenes. And this became even more important when we see a transition of communist systems that became capitalist systems, fully market-based systems. Because some places, um, parts of uh, Eastern Europe, for example, if we think of uh, Slovenia, for example, which is, is now quite an affluent country and uh, um, near to Italy, one of the strongest parts of the Yugoslav economy, uh, they had some very strong companies before World War II that became state-dominated companies that continued to function very much like uh, Western companies did all through the communist era, and indeed to be significant exporters to global markets, even during the communist period. And they were able to make a fairly effective transition to market-based open capitalism after the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and uh, the uh, general shift towards more liberal market uh, economies. So everywhere we see uh, the, the state plays a role in economies, even in uh, places that identify themselves as champions of capitalism, and particularly the United States, we'll see that the state is a major provider. Um, and then there are a bunch of hybrid organizations. There are lots of private organizations that are not for profit. This is a very important point. We'll see in some societies, particularly uh, Christian societies, we'll see a long tradition of church institutions, particularly Catholic church institutions in sectors such as health. And uh, if we look at the numbers, you'll see in some countries, the hospital system is overwhelmingly run by the state directly. In other places, um, it's overwhelmingly privately run. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, for profit. Some of you who've been on study abroad, and unfortunately some of you would like to be on study abroad and can't go now, who were looking to go to Europe would know, for example, um, in countries such as, say, Belgium or Italy uh, or Spain, that you have a whole lot of universities with Catholic in the title. Um, why was this? Well, effectively, the Catholic Church maintained um, a very significant set of education institutions. The state separately provided education institutions. Uh, the state was often controlled in the, the late 19th and particularly the 20th century by left-wingers, more socialistically inclined. And so the Catholic Church, afraid of their influence, their secular, anti-religious, or at least irreligious influence, uh, expanded the scale of Catholic universities. So this is why we do see, if you just look down the, whisk, the list of Waseda exchange partners, uh, that you have state universities, uh, you have uh, religious uh, origin universities, um, and then you have other private universities that were not religious affiliated. But this is exactly Japan. You know, this is um, uh, the case with uh, Waseda, some, you know, friendly rivals such as um, Sophia and ICU were obviously established by Christian missionaries. Um, both Keo and Waseda uh, private institutions that were established by prominent identities, uh, political identities, of course. Um, uh, 
former prime ministers and, and uh, intellectuals, um, as in the case of uh, Keo. And then you've got the state universities who are now in this um, kind of independent state owned, but no longer directly state controlled. So we'll see that even in the most fundamental things like health and education, enormous variation in terms of state provision for profit, um, private provision, not for profit, private provision. And we do see some um, for profit universities as well. Uh, generally, the for profits uh, do, all, do all right, sometimes do quite well. So, in the Japanese case, one that um, started off being um, a strange enigma to people, but actually has become very popular, um, with a, quite a good hensachi now, is like Digital Hollywood Daigaku. Um, that's uh, established by a for profit uh, company that were originally running private education. Um, training programs and then Simon Gakko and whatnot. Um, they considered shifting to be uh, um, a educational um, foundation, um, a not-for-profit, but actually the ministry made it more kind of difficult. We we'll see that uh, there are various reasons why uh, not-for-profits, MPOs, NGO organizations tend to do better in some sectors, particularly in universities. A major reason why not-for-profits do well is, well, very simply, people won't donate money to company-run organizations. It's quite straightforward. Um, in terms of selling specialist applied education, uh, of course, people go to Lek in Japan, they go to Juku, all of these things, they have no problems with them being businesses. And uh, similarly, if you want to learn to, to do programming or uh, web design or game design or something, you know, paying money to a for-profit such as DH, Digital Hollywood, is fine. But people won't donate lots of money to a for-profit institution for research. So NGOs that just have an education mission and not a profit mission tend to be the much better basis for organizing research-centered universities. So Sogo Daigaku, Kenkyo Nutrition Institute, Sogo Daigaku, Daitai, Gaku Hojin Base, Ariwa Chokano, Kokoe, Kyu Kokoe. So kind of run by the state. Uh, but in many societies, state-run universities, uh, companies don't like to donate them because they're worried that the state bureaucrats and whatnot will be misusing the, uh, the money for you know, various political purposes and whatnot. So one of the key themes in this course is actually uh, to understand this mix of state and private. And some of these statistics we'll look at will give a sense of this. Um, now, some of the statistics here are a few years old. I, uh, over the last couple of days, looked around to try and find later versions of, of some of these and um, couldn't, so I've gone with some of the older ones, some of them I was able to update. I've had a preference for nice data visualization over contemporary data because the statistics don't really matter. It's more just to tell some stories. Um, so let me have another swig of work. Okay. Um, one of the nice things about data visualization is you get this, you get a look at like this. This does look like a donut, um, and uh, of course we see uh, America. This back in two thousand fifteen, um, America is um, as an economy itself uh, a quarter of the world, um, which is a really substantial factor. China has become much much larger. Um, it's now about three times the size of the Japanese economy, but of course it's got a much larger population, so per capita income. Um, means that uh, still, of course, Japan on a per capita basis is uh, much wealthier. Uh, and lots of other economies which have influence and very, very affluent places, um, of course, are small parts of the economy. Uh, they have relatively small populations. Uh, one of the interesting things is to think in terms of countries' influence and their reputation, um, how well their standing is in the world for whether it's business, whether it's their, their liberal outlook, you know, it's their values, it's their cultural impact, um, or as a model, for example, say with a welfare system such as Sweden, uh, very often these societies actually have relatively small populations. Um, one of my uh, interesting examples of this um, in if we think of a country like Iceland, Iceland has huge influence in contemporary art scenes now, for example, two of my favorite artists, um, um, 
Olafur Eliasson and uh, particularly Ragnar Kjartansson doing really interesting contemporary art. Um, you know, they're from a society that's got a population of about 600,000. And uh, I met an Icelandic guy at a conference recently and I mentioned, oh, you know, I particularly like this artist. And he goes, oh, I was drinking beers at his house the other day. Um, he's a kind of friend of my cousin kind of thing, you know? So um, now not everyone is related to each other in a society with 600,000, but um, it is an important thing to keep in mind that some of the places that really set the benchmark um, for thinking about a good society, and we'll look at places such as Denmark, for example, um, have relatively very small populations. That's not to say that their lessons aren't transferable to much larger societies. Um, but it is worth keeping in mind that many of the, for example, Scandinavian examples and Northern European examples we look at, their entire population is actually smaller than one large city, say in China um, or in India. Anyway, this is, that's a general visualization of size of population. What's more interesting, of course, is to get a sense of what this actually means per capita. So you take the total size of the economy, divide it by the population, um, but you have to be very careful with how you use the data here. This is a simple visualization. Um, the darker the color, uh, the more affluent it is, of course. Um, and I think intuitively we, uh, we generally know this. Um, but often when we look at the data, there are lots of complicating things. Um, one of the traps is this little thing you might see here after GDP, um, PPP, um, purchasing power parity. Now, what that does is statistics, when they're trying, to, um, st statisticians, when they're trying to figure out um, whether this means, what this actually means, um, income per capita, they want to adjust for the cost of living. I mean, to, to, to put it simply, um, a cabbage in a market in uh, China generally is cheaper than a cabbage in a market in uh, Japan, okay? So while on headline terms at the current exchange rate, you may have a, um, an ordinary worker in Japan earning more than an ordinary worker in China, um, if the cost of the basic things you need to live are so much higher, then you're actually not much better off. But, uh, it all depends on what you're doing and, uh, and what purpose you're using the statistics for. If, for example, you are working for Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, or VMH, and you're trying to figure out, well, what proportion of the population can afford to buy our product? And we have a policy of kind of global pricing. We don't want to have vastly different prices across different markets because that causes what we call arbitrage. People doing bakugai cheap in one place and bringing it to another and trying to make a profit instead of the company capturing it. So common prices. Um, so what proportion of the population can afford to buy our product? PPP doesn't help very much um, because what it tends to do is it exaggerates the seeming um, purchasing power of people. Um, so in short, if your purpose is to find out what proportion of people in a particular economy or country can afford to buy things at global market prices, PPP isn't very helpful. Um, on the other hand, PPP is very helpful when you're trying to figure out relative levels of happiness and well-being. You know, so... Um, and those of you who've traveled in, uh, say, the Mediterranean, if you've, if you've been to Greece, for example, would know that um, Greece has, of course, um, had lots of headline um, sad stories for the last decades about how poor the economy is. But when you go to Greece, you also discover that you can um, rent a little house on a Greek island living, uh, looking over the sea on a, um, um, for summer, it's going to be more expensive. But on a yearly basis, maybe uh, you, could, you could rent a house overlooking the sea for 400 euros, um, rock a a year. Uh, you can go and buy a whole bucket of incredibly delicious tomatoes for 100 yen. Um, and uh, you could live um, very, very happily on salads, looking over the sea, going fishing for not very much. And Greece also has a very good public health system, for example. So it's actually a pretty attractive place to kind of uh, retire to. You know, if on the other hand, uh, you look to the cost of living, say, for example, in place in, in Copenhagen, um, particularly if you're looking at, at 
things like eating out, you realize that the cost of living can be incredibly um, high. There are ways to keep it down. Um, some societies try to have a little bit of the best of both worlds in that they have uh, differential tax systems. For example, Israel uh, has quite a high uh, consumption tax, Shohize, but uh, veg, fresh fruit and vegetables are exempted because they think that you should be encouraging people to eat um, good, healthy food. So the vegetables are super cheap, uh, but a whole range of kind of manufactured and processed foods and whatnot are rather more expensive uh, than they would be um, in Japan. So there is a lot of policy attempts to kind of direct people's behavior in certain ways. Japan is a little bit of a strange one because uh, relative to say Europe, um, the hard liquor, uh, whiskey and cigarettes are really, really cheap here um, compared to most places in Europe where they have sin taxes on them. Um, that's the, uh, the informal expression for setting taxes. When governments put, uh, want to raise taxes, the easiest way to do it is to tax alcohol and cigarettes um, because it simultaneously serves public health benefits uh, while also raising revenue. Now, the, the one other important thing we need to keep in mind when we look at statistics is that um, some countries with small populations um, and either very strong natural resource endowments uh, or trading centers tend to have um, exaggeratedly high incomes. Uh, one of the most extreme is actually if we look at a place like um, Luxembourg. Luxembourg, in terms, if you look at the statistics on how much investment it attracts, foreign investment, it's the largest foreign investment destination in Europe. That's because it has very low tax rates. So lots of companies, including many Japanese companies, officially make their headquarters for Europe in Luxembourg, put their money through Luxembourg and then into France or Germany or elsewhere as a tax minimization strategy. So sometimes that get captured in GDP statistics as well. Uh, let's have a look at Qatar over on this list here. Qatar, way up the top in terms of GDP per capita. Qatar has huge um, natural gas resources. They were the, well, I think they still are the largest export of LNG, liquid natural gas. That's gas that's pumped up and through a very intensive process, turned into a liquid form um, and carried in effectively what are floating bombs, <laughs> um, but very secured floating bombs, and, and it's a major source of Japanese energy. Uh, Australia is about to overtake Qatar as the world's last, largest producer of LNG, um, but still Qatar's a huge producer, and it has a relatively small population. Anyone who's been to any of the Gulf states will know that there's market inequality there, that you have a uh, literally a minority of locals um, Arab locals, family connections to whether it's you know the UAE or Qatar or Bahrain, longer term, and then you've got very large expatriate communities. Now, some of those expats are paid very, very well, um, financial services, security, a whole range of things. Um, and then there's large numbers of guest workers, construction workers and whatnot, um, overwhelmingly from places such as um, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, um, and they tend to be paid much, much worse. Um, there tends to be div division of labor. If you, uh, for an example, in Abu Dhabi, uh, you'll see in the UAE, you'll see that the taxi drivers are overwhelmingly Nepalis. Many construction workers tend to be more from Bangladesh, for example, and there are language issues and there's a whole bunch of things there. So we need to be very alert to these inequalities. Macau, of course, those of you who know Macau, um, Macau is a very strange place and you have people there for many, many hundreds of years, but also it's this um, gambling mecca, um, the only place with casinos that can be uh, accessed easily from the Chinese mainland. So you get um, this highly exaggerated GDP per capita. Um, you can still eat very, very cheaply and very, very well in Macau. It's just a culinary heaven. Um, and, but you wouldn't look at it, you wouldn't think so if you looked at the statistics on GDP per capita, you think it would be hugely expensive to eat out. Um, Singapore is more well-rounded. There there's a little bit of statistical artifice here because there's such large expat communities. It is major centers of banking, uh, commercial centers, a very large proportion of Japanese companies have their Southeast Asian headquarters based in Singapore, for example, and of course, some of you have 
I know I went to school there, for example. Um, indeed, there's even uh, Japanese schools. Um, uh, Shibushibu has a, uh, a partnership with Waseda actually um, in an institution in Singapore um, serving expat communities. So that tends to raise the income. But nonetheless, Singaporean incomes for locals themselves are very high. Although you also have the whole phenomenon again of maids and whatnot. Brunei again is boosted by uh, natural resources as is Kuwait. Um, that's the United Arab Emirates. Hong Kong, I think we everyone understands a very distinctive place that Hong Kong has had as a, um, we call entrepot, a center for uh, trade connections between China and the world. Um, much of that is now in question with all the, uh, the politics. So on a PPP per capita uh, purchasing power parity basis, Japan drops down uh, substantially lower. Um, a very significant thing to note though, is that on either basis, straight statistics or the, the adapted um, PPP purchasing power basis, um, Japanese in, uh, GDP per capita relative to places such as Singapore and South Korea is much lower than many Japanese think. So there's many Japanese have a, you know, opinion polls have showed this, uh, they still tend to think that places like Singapore and South Korea are a lot poorer than Japan, and they're not. Um, the South Korean economy has had much higher rates of sustained economic growth over the last couple of decades than Japan. Um, and in certain measures, the incomes are comparable. However, and uh, we will talk further about this, um, distinctive features of the labor market in the two places mean very different outlooks um, for employment. South Korea, the outlook for students wanting to get a, a job in some of the more prestigious companies which pay so much better than smaller companies is really tough. There's intense competition. Um, and so there's a lot of pessimism about employment prospects. Japan, on the other hand, two decades of economic underperformance, companies didn't, didn't hire so much, baby boomers retiring until the uh, corona um, shock. Uh, this was probably the very best of times ever um, in Japanese history. I often say this, that like, it's probably uh, until corona um, is probably the easiest time in, in Japan since maybe Jomon Jidai um, to get a job because there was such a shortage of people. I think that is one factor in that quite interesting survey result we saw yesterday in class that many of you are actually not so worried about the, the impacts of corona on employment. If I had done that little quiz in um, a South Korean university, even like Yonsei or you know, somewhere, quite prestigious university, I think there would have been very high levels of worry because South Korean companies are so dependent on exports and the global economy looks in a bad way and many Korean companies have got hiring freezes. So it would have been, um, I think, a, uh, a much more pessimistic set of findings if I'd surveyed Korean students um, alone about what they thought the outlook was. Um, just uh, one final example here I want to highlight. Israel, the dangers of average statistics. Israel is several economies. Um, it's, it's, it's about like four different economies. Um, five if you add the, uh, the occupied territories of you know, the West Bank. Um, and well, Gaza is not occupied, um, but it's, 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 it's a mess. Um, the Tel Aviv Haifa bubbles along the coast, um, uh, very dynamic economy, world-class, high levels of entrepreneurship, startups, um, some astonishing proportion of innovations that come in IT come out of a small number of you know, Israeli institutions and startups and whatnot. And um, they are right up there with Silicon Valley. In fact, so many Israelis are in Silicon Valley. Um, on the other hand, you then have large ultra-Orthodox communities, which are generally poor, large numbers of kids. They, uh, they live more by the, uh, uh, by the, by the Torah, um, you know, by the, uh, the Bible and, and uh, their own community values than by you know, economic logics. And there's often state subsidies and state, state assistance. Um, then amongst Arab communities, there are those who are in a more fragile situation, um, who don't have um, 
uh, residence rights in Israel proper and uh, crossing uh, day to day, um, internal kind of um, borders, you know, from the West Bank, they're in a vulnerable position. But uh, they're also over 20% of the Israeli population are Arabs, they're Israeli citizens, and uh, they are often quite affluent and uh, many very significant businesses owned by Arab entrepreneurs. And a very interesting thing in the Israeli case is that many of the most accomplished doctors in um, Israel are Arab Israelis. It's a long tradition of particularly Christian Arabs in medical education. So the dangers of looking at overall statistics that we really need to do a deep dive into each national story and see what we're seeing. And I'm looking at Taiwan as well. I'll come back and talk very specifically about Taiwan. Taiwan is very interesting because it's so connected into the mainland, but, but um, also very connected into places like Silicon Valley, Japan and whatnot, um, and very large Taiwanese um, migrant communities in the US, Canada, um, Australia, and it makes for a very distinctive and very dynamic economy and society. Now, let me have a swig of water. Um, a lot of people just assume that Japan's had no growth for two decades. You know, if you ask a lot of foreigners, they say that, of course, that surprises Japanese. Um, but uh, actually, it's not quite two lost decades. It's been a bit up and down. Um, the, uh, the simple truth though, is that if Japan grows at an average of 1% a year, um, the uh, Nichigen Bank of Japan is happy. That's what all its baseline economic models are on. Uh, there are other colleagues uh, here who can tell you much more about that, including uh, one of my economist colleagues who we recently hired from the Bank of Japan. Um, so I'm not the guy to get an education on Japanese macro policy. Um, go to uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Shino Sensei and um, uh, uh, Ishikawa Sensei, both of them are excellent economists. Um, but the uh, important thing is this, this story of gradual def deflation. Uh, one of the most um, influential economics commentators in Europe recently talked pessimistically about Europe and he said, Europe has succumbed to Japanification. Um, that was his description, Japanification. That, um, uh, Europe will have economic recovery, but it will be the typical adjective people use is anemic. It'll kind of, kind of trot along. Um, and we'll see some fundamental reasons for this. Um, low democratic, demographic growth. The population just simply in Japan and many European countries is shrinking, not growing. Um, this is one of the key stories. One of the simple takeaways from all of these statistics, when we get to it, you'll see, is that there is a virtual cycle of a growing population when the growing population is achieved in a sustainable way by growing your infrastructure and your education and lifting your education level as well. One of the simplest way to do this is to brain drain, steal smart people from the rest of the world, that the rest of the world pays for their education and you take them. So countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States have a huge advantage in being able to, as migrant destinations, pick the best and brightest. Um, and to, uh, to capture that human capital and maintain optimism about their economic prospects, therefore attract more investment, um, and it becomes a virtual cycle. And we'll see that only a minority of countries have been able to achieve this. A very important thing with the United States though, and um, when we do a deep dive into the European experience, is that um, very often this is happening at a regional level or a city level rather than a national level. So there are cities such as Berlin, for example, which is a huge draw card for bright, bright people, um, interesting businesses. Tesla, for example, is building a huge plant just outside Berlin. Um, most people think the main reason is because Elon Musk thinks Berlin's pretty cool. Um, you know, this is a really striking thing for, for Tesla to do. Um, so there is uh, very clearly a national story of places like Australia and New Zealand in this virtuous cycle. In the US, it's, um, we can see um, California itself has absolutely the, uh, this dynamic and then a subset of cities seem to have this dynamic more than others. 
And uh, this is, will be one of our themes when we talk about place, that very often the sources of dynamism are not actually nations or even regions, but actually particular cities and what, what drives this. So let's have a look a little bit at economic growth, where economic growth has been before Corona hit. Because headline figures, you know, you, you look at a place like France, the UK and whatnot, in one quarter, the equivalent of 20% shrinking in the economy. It's just devastating. But this question, will we get a V recovery? Will it be a bounce back? Well, one of the really important things to keep in mind in terms of broader outlooks is how are economies doing in all these years before the you know, corona shock? And so these statistics tend to give us um, a sense of the problem um, that we see in some places. So Japan, um, rates of growth, it's 2011 to 15 and then 2016 to 20. That forecast, of course, 20, um, they've been disrupted. So you see there that, you know, these are the, uh, the estimates and these are the actual forecasts that Japan didn't achieve 1% growth. Now that's actually not too bad at all on a per capita basis. Remember if your population is shrinking, um, but your economy is growing, your income per capita is actually growing. Uh, so it's quite a good story um, if you're one of the winners. And, uh, you know, until at least Corona came along, Generally, SIL students were very much in a strong position. They could, um, with good English and whatnot, to some degree, they could sell themselves at an international price. But when you've got things like shrinking population, um, a pessimistic outlook for real estate prices, for example, some of the biggest things that you buy in life, you know, particularly you know, a house or whatever, get cheaper over time. So if your income is rising while well, your cost of living is actually falling because things like the cost of real estate is falling, then um, you are going to get relatively more and more affluent. By contrast, um, we can look at headline figures such as Australia there. Um, this, this, this data is from Australia. That's why it's highlighted. It's not because I, I just want to talk about Australia. It's just, it's a good visualization, but it's happened to be done by the um, Central Bank of Australia. Um, so we look at the Australian figures, the uh, Australia over the last uh, decade has had um, substantially larger economic growth uh, than Japan, but the Australian population has grown much larger and real estate prices have uh, risen arguably insanely. There are reasons for the tax system and whatnot. So that actually, uh, yes, lots of people earn higher incomes um, and have a better outlook in terms of rising incomes, but uh, they also have million dollar mortgages to, to buy a house in uh, Sydney. So we really need to look at in totality how these factors are impacting and then to ask where you stand in a particular system. Um, talking to a former student, my former TA, um, last night, she uh, today starts work for a Japanese company, so she came to do an isatsu to me, which was very, very nice. Um, we're talking about, you know, how starting salaries for Japanese companies are really awful. <laughs> um, but uh, to keep it in perspective that the cost of living is not too bad, you can get your own apartment um, quite cheaply here in Tokyo, whereas in by contrast in Beijing or Shanghai, um, unless you're actually uh, living with family in a convenient place, um, even though the headline um, salary might be quite good and often it's not, uh, the cost of living eats up so much. So what we do need to do is to think more about economic resilience. Um, how much did societies actually st have stop-start growth? Uh, one of the most important things uh, in any economic system is expectations. Uh, it's a virtuous cycle of positive expectations. And this is where um, the annual story gives us some hints. Um, and this graphic here looks at real GDP growth and um, down the bottom um, during the period there, 1992 to 2015, so quite a long period of time, it says how many years of negative economic growth and so we see in this period, 1992 to 2015, how many years did the economy go backwards? So how many years were there recession? The definition of a recession is two quarters, so half a year of negative economic growth. 
Now, Australia actually um, set the record, and this is not a national boast, it's a simple truth, um, of unbroken years of economic growth. Um, went from um, 1991 until this year with no recession, um, and that overtook the Dutch post-war record. So in human history, no society had um, such a prolonged period of economic growth as Australia did. Um, what this means in terms of people expectations is profoundly significant. The positive element is if people expect the economy to keep growing, they don't hesitate to spend money. They don't hesitate to borrow a half a million dollars to buy their first apartment. They don't hesitate to take on $100,000 in debt to go to university, to go to business school, do an MBA, for example, um, because they expect to pay it back. Um, that's a virtuous cycle of confidence. And um, economists have spent a lot of time talking about this. They talk about rational expectations. The problem though, is when you do get hit by a shock such as Corona, um, where suddenly the economy is thrown into recession, people are not ready for it. So those societies that have been more stop start, people have um, in a sense, more likely to be less debt burdened, more cash in the bank, have certain resilience, but, be stuck in long-term lower economic growth because people are very hesitant to spend money. And so we see this is the Japan story. In the same period, Japan had six years of negative economic growth in total, and the average growth rate for 1992 to 2015 was 0.8%. Italy, 0.6%. Um, the Netherlands, um, or so 1.9%, the entire EU had 1.4% growth in this whole period after the ending of the, um, uh, the Cold War. The United States averaged 2.6% growth a year, every single year. And of course, this is compounding. So what this means is a very sustained cumulative economic growth with optimism. So when you look at these longer term stories, you can understand why economists are actually much more optimistic about the United States responding quite well to Corona over the next couple of years, coming out of it, returning to its long term growth uh, trajectory. Um, it uh, is one of these sobering things in Japan that uh, all public officials, Nichigen economists, uh, like Shino Sensei was, for example, are really resigned to the idea that um, if Japan achieves 1% economic growth, that is a fantastic result. That's kind of outlined performance. That's the goal of the Bank of Japan. Whereas um, the head of the FERB, uh, so the, the FRB, so, um, said that uh, the US would only grow at 1% a year, they would be out of a job um, in no time. We look down at developing countries in the end. Um, we'll talk about Russia. Russia has years of great prosperity when the um, oil and natural gas price is high, and it has years of major setbacks, very stop start. Um, China, Vietnam, and India, um, let's look at their growth rates. China over this period, 10% a year growth rate. Um, so we see, for example, in the auto market that um, back in 1992, China was a tiny percentage of the Japanese market. Um, the uh, PRC now, the auto market, does, what's it, 29 million units or something. Um, so it's, some, it's a market something like 20, 20 times larger than the Japanese market, okay, over a relatively short period of time. So you can see why so many foreign companies have been focused on the opportunities that China presented. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about repeatedly in the course is the natural resource advantage, okay? Um, natural resource endowments, um, they make possible economic development, um, but they can potentially be a curse. Um, they need good public governance, laws, institutions, effective policy making, because natural resources can just simply be a source of massive corruption. And we'll see in problems in Cambodia, in Thailand, in many, um, countries in Africa, for example, that um, fights over, political fights over the right to extract natural resources can be politically uh, distorting. Even basic things like fishing rights. Um, you, 
uh, none of you are old enough to know about this, but uh, there was um, kind of almost a war between the UK and um, Iceland back in the 1970s over fishing rights. And the UK was completely in the wrong. Um, they were defending the right of um, uh, UK fishermen to go within two miles of the coast of Iceland and catch um, a whole bunch of fish. And uh, the Icelanders very strenuously resisted this and arrested a bunch of um, British fishermen and whatnot. Um, Britain ended up losing it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. These were literally referred to as the Cod Wars. Um, yeah, country with a population, you know, 50 times, 60 times Iceland um, insisting on the right to take their fish was, was pretty outrageous. But within Iceland itself, if you ask Icelanders about this, they say, oh, yeah, but um, there's a few lucky families who've got the rights to do most of the fishing and we don't benefit from that. So natural resources um, raise a lot of rights issues. Excuse me. <coughs> a recurrent theme in the course is going to be adaptive efficiency. Um, you're going to see it exactly like this slide, like this again. So I'm going to come back to it. Um, I just want to simply show you through another donut or a couple of donuts, how economies can make a dramatic change. Again, because it's a good visualization, not because I'm Australian, but I'll use the Australian case. Um, a lot of people, you know, you think of Australia and you think mm, lots of cows, um, wheat and all the rest of it. Um, so this is very much the image of the uh, Australian economy. You have kits and udon and, uh, you know, the udon uh, is, you know, made with Australian flour and is this real Japanese food? You get all these kind of debates. Um, and so you'd think Australia simply um, lives off things like wheat and uh, wool. Um, now, if we were to go back to 1960s, you'd, you'd see that even in the 19, in 1960, um, that only about 13% of the economy was actually uh, primary products, agriculture and mining. But I want you to have a look at that number, 12.8% primary. Agriculture, 11%. Mining was only 1.8% of the Australian economy in 1960s. So it was, it was negligible. Um, you know, it's a joke in Australia that um, until 1970, it was actually illegal to export iron ore because they thought that if ever there was a war, Australia might need iron ore um, for military purposes. But if you fly over Australia, you'd know why we call it the red center. You look down, it's all red. Why is it red? Because everywhere is kind of rusting iron or tiny pellets turned into sand. The whole country, um, I, don't know, I don't know how even um, compasses even work there, has iron ore everywhere. And we will see that it became a huge export industry with um, massive implications for the structure of the economy. But also historically, things like tertiary, retailing, transport, wholesaling, tertiary, um, it's kind of services in general, 13.4%. Um, let's have a look at the secondary, manufacturing, 28.9%. So a third of the economy it used to be very high taxes, 100% tax on an imported car, even when I was a kid into Australia. Now, and this is why I want to say, don't be too quick to think uh, neoliberalism is evil. Neoliberalism in the Australian case brought 30 years of sustained economic growth. Um, we no longer have a car industry. Um, we no longer have taxes on cars. Uh, it uh, used to be double the global market price um, to buy even a basic car in Australia. Now we get dirt cheap cars made in Korea, in Thailand, um, in Japan, and uh, we're making money in other ways. Now, I'm gonna roll back again. Mining, 1.8%, 1960. Um, this is 2012, mining 10.3%, um, but other services, a large part of services actually relates to the mining industry and whatnot. So that actually what's happened in the Australian case, um, something that looks like a very traditional industry, mining has become a much larger part of the economy. But actually mining is massively capital intensive. Hardly any people work in it. Um, it's done remotely by ro robots, um, even the huge trucks that actually ship um, the iron ore um, out of the mine are made by Japanese companies and they're remotely operated by guys, you know, sitting in air conditioned offices in Perth, driving huge trucks uh, up in the Pilbara, um, a thousand miles away. 
we see other sectors, finance, insurance, um, becoming very significant. Professional, technical, and, and scientific becoming something like 7%. Healthcare becoming very large, for example. Education and training, sectors that were relatively tiny. Um, and most significantly, manufacturing 7.9% shrunk dramatically um, from 30 uh, odd percent. So Australia decided to let a lot of its manufacturing die. Um, and I'm going to show you the only product I know that is considered world class, that has huge market share, that's actually made in Australia. And that is Rode Mics. Um, this one costs 35,000 yen. Um, Called Stun um, with going online teaching um, because Wasa didn't give us a budget for that, um, but I could complain about that all day. Uh, but the interesting story is actually this company was created by uh, Swedish and British migrants, uh, and the name has a very Scandinavian kind of name, is honor, honor of his uh, Scandi kind of ancestors. But it is this interesting thing, you know, whenever, whenever Australians see a road, they say, Oh, yes, Australia actually can make something. Um, where what Australia does extraordinarily well in, in is the kind of the ideas business and design and uh, architecture um, and uh, engineering and interestingly forensic accounting and a whole range of things. But also a lot of things such as natural resources are not just capital intensive. Um, your typical processing plant for liquid natural gas to take the gas from under the sea um, to chill it, to turn it into a liquid and to put it into ships and send it to Japan. Um, one of those floating platforms costs about $10 billion to build. Um, the Koreans are the world's best at this. Uh, the Koreans build floating LNG platforms, which are then towed from Korea to the Mediterranean or to the coast off Australia and anchored um, and operate there. And then there's all of the software and all of those things that are uh, used to do this. So um, here's a, just a, a graphic representation of what we see. Um, resources becoming a much larger export, re, um, rural becoming less significant. And if we were to, to look over here on the left-hand side, um, some of the things that Australia used to be very famous for, it's beef, it's wool indeed. And after World War II, they said Australia rode on the sheep's back. Um, with the Korean war boom um, and particularly Japan making lots of fabrics for the American military during the Korean war, suddenly Australia exported all this wool and had a huge boom, but it's tiny by comparison with the scale um, of things like coal. And of course with global warming, it's a huge you know, challenge for the economy, iron ore um, and a whole range of other things. Um, Australian wine is a big export, but uh, the government is frequently reminded by economists that, yeah, it's, we have a nice image about as a winemaker, but in the end, um, iron ore is really what pays the bills. Now, uh, this is a bit of a controversial organization. The Heritage Foundation it tends to be a bit conservative, but it really emphasizes the degree of freedom in terms of market systems, and it plots it by color. Um, we'll come back to these discussions and how we have these definitions on these things. Um, one thing we will come back to, we're, we're going to talk very specifically about this, I'm just showing it now, is this issue of inequality. And um, far and away the best selling book on this in a very long time, to the point where people say that um, Thomas Piketty, the author, is the kind of the new Karl Marx, a French economist, wrote this book, Capital, uh, like Das Kapital, Capital, in the 21st century, and now a new one, Capital and Ideology. Um, very sophisticated economic analysis of um, rising inequality. And we'll come back to it later on because it is a separate conversation. Um, but we'll, uh, one of the takeaways is that after World War II, we saw significant declines in inequality and we've seen an increase in inequality again. Um, but depending on the country, it's more extreme in some places than other places. So we'll be looking at some of those issues. Um, in, any, in any society, uh, where do you direct your capital to? Um, obviously, economies that are better able to shift their uh, capital, or their human capital, their financial capital and whatnot into more productive sectors, are likely to do better. Okay. 
And so this is a graphic representation of relative productivity. Um, and we see that actually, you know, Australia is not so good at manufacturing. Um, the productivity is kind of lower. So it's kind of natural that more of the resources would go into a whole range of other sectors. Australia, on the other hand, is actually very good at construction. Um, ironically, one reason is because they had to learn to deal with very militant unions. So they had to develop safe workplaces using technology, pr um, project management and whatnot. So software um, for managing production system, planning production. And so those companies are represented. Um, one company, and we'll, we'll look at this example, a company called Atlassian, worth billions, now Australia's wealthiest individuals, two young guys who created the most commonly used software platform, Jura and Trello, for um, what we call agile um, workflows, uh, collaborative uh, programming in ICT. So lots of open source software, people using shared platforms, and they... Uh, to the, uh, the guys who develop the, uh, the platforms that allow programmers to collaborate um, very much out of that tradition of project management strength in the Australian case are now uh, the wealthiest individuals around. So ranking in terms of economic freedom, um, you can look through this yourselves. Um, maybe it wouldn't be surprising. Um, I want to point to a country like Chile though. Chile was very interesting under the Pinochet regime. Um, it was quite authoritarian for a while. Um, Chile as a Latin American country has really transitioned to be quite a dynamic market uh, economy. Some of the other places that are on the list might, might be of interest to you. Um, we see countries like Estonia managed to throw off the Soviet legacy and become very dynamic, um, great startup culture there, for example. Um, but of course, it's not just about the economy. It's really about the, uh, the quality of life. And so we've got statistics and things like the Human Development Index. Um, we see countries such as Norway, well, it's, again, it's like promoting Australia, but not Norway, the Netherlands um, pop up very high. A lot of European countries really outperform there. Japan always does very well on this, very good social infrastructure, good health systems um, and whatnot. We can go into the regions. Um, the way they define the regions, they tend to put the whole of the, uh, the Middle East there. So we see uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Israel, Singapore, UAE and whatnot tend to rank very highly. Um, and then the, uh, the ones who rank not poorly as well. Okay. Um, and you can, you can do a deep dive into those statistics if you're interested. Now, happiness. You know, um, we will come back very specifically to a discussion of happiness in the course because, you know, um, what's the point of governing economies if you're not really governing to make people happy? And one of the most uh, robust findings in so many of these surveys is that the Nordics always keep topping the happiness index. Now, I know Professor Bacon, my colleague here, likes to say that's because the Scandinavians have much lower expectations in life than the English do. I remember Paul, when we talked about this, you know, he said, you know, for a Scandinavian, they look out the window and say, hmm, okay, it's um, not minus 20. Um, wow, I'm happy. Okay. Uh, so that people start with uh, modest expectations. Well, that's all right. Uh, I was once told by an author, ultra orthodox guy in um, Tel Aviv, you know, lots of people always agonizing, is my glass half full? Is my glass half empty? Um, the implication is very simple. Get a smaller glass and then your glass is always full. And he had a really good point that um, if you actually manage your expectations, uh, you're more likely to feel happy in the first place. Okay. So a lot of our unhappiness comes from internalized notions of how successful we should be. And I think that helps to explain the quandary um, about Europe. Why is it the places with the worst weather have the happiest people? Um, you'd think that everyone down in the Mediterranean would be happy. Um, but this is to some degree the Hawaii effect. Uh, there are very significant issues of um, depression in Hawaii amongst people who move to Hawaii. Uh, they move with this notion that, um, well, I gotta go, I'm just gonna go live in Hawaii and I'm gonna be super happy, but wherever you go, you take yourself with you, right? Okay. So, 
we need a better understanding of the foundations of happiness and what we know and why the Scandi countries and the, Nor we, the Nordics, when we include Finland, Scandinavia, if we leave Finland out, uh, um, what we know is that anxiety about your future outlook is one of the most um, negative elements in terms of perceived happiness. If you think that if fortune does not smile upon you, that if you suddenly get ill or you lose your job, that there is welfare for you, that the medical system will be there for you, that you will be looked after, then you become much more accepting of what life gives you, makes you much more optimistic. And if you're much more optimistic, you're actually much more likely to do interesting things. And we'll see statistically what's really interesting is because it's safe to fail in Scandinavia, people do lots of adventurous things. Uh, they're more likely to quit their job to travel internationally. They're more likely to start a company because if it doesn't work out, you're not going to starve in the street. Um, whereas if there's nothing to fall back on, you become more risk averse. That becomes one of our key takeaways. And so actually, Dynamic market systems, entrepreneurship, and social democracy can go hand to hand, in hand in hand, in interesting ways. Um, now, I'm sure many of you are wondering about happiness, and I'm conscious I've only got a few minutes left of time here. Um, so, you want the kind of takeaway? What's trend average happiness? Happiness. Um, Japan is kind of like its economy. You know, it's 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 not unhappy. It's not it's not an economic disaster, but it's just like da 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 da. Um, uh, I guess, you know, if you think about it, if you ask Japanese, you know, are you happy? We should make this homework. I might do this next week, have a breakout. Are you happy? Mm. I, I, I think a lot of people go, Shawasika, Shawasika, what is happy? I don't know. Mm. Shawasika, no? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, that's kind of statistically where Japan is, so, okay? Um, that we see that people are not kind of off the charts, you know, um, like that a song Google you can find it on YouTube. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. You know, there's no one clicking their heels, um, overflowing with joie de vivre, but people are just kind of soldiering on. Okay. Um, some statistics make stark that although it's only a my minority of people, that minority of people are so incredibly unhappy or at least lacking in support that they actually take the exit option in the worst possible way, suicide rates. Lithuania, it's historical data, it's quite old now, it's 10 years old, but it's off the charts in terms of male suicide. And we know South Korea has long struggled with this. Japan doesn't look so good in the statistics as well either. Um, one of the really striking things with suicide though is it's much more of a um, male and masculinity issue um, than it is uh, for women, although those suicide rates are still quite quite concerning in, in some countries close to us. Um, now, this is uh, where I, I wanted to get to and leave here, and we can, we can pick up some of the other comparative statistics next class. Um, so it's one thing about relative happiness. Um, it's just this broader question, though, about community, and we'll come back to that. Um, we'll come back to this repeatedly, where community is one of our key cultural sources. Um, and in a lot of the discussions of Japanese uh, economy relative to the US, it's emphasized that Japan is more communitarian rather than the US. And yet we see some really striking paradoxes. Um, this is the World Giving Index, okay? Um, quite robust stuff. It's done by Gallup polling. And uh, it works off three basic questions. Have you helped a stranger or someone you didn't know who needed help? Have you donated money to charity? Have you volunteered your time to an organization? Okay. Um, the findings are stunning. Okay. Um, top 10 countries helping a stranger, Liberia, Sierra Leone, United States, Kenya, Zambia, Uganda, Nigeria, Iraq, Canada, Malawi, and New Zealand. Bottom 10 countries for helping a stranger. Hate to tell you, but consistently one of the lowest ranked countries on this survey is actually Japan, okay? Um, if you ask many Japanese, they think that China is really, really bad, but consistently uh, Japan 
comes in worse even than China uh, as just not a very kind place. <laughs> um, and this is, a, this is a bit of a quandary. Uh, one of the defensive explanations for Japan is being saying that this is self-reported, that people are asked, um, have you helped someone? And the defense is, well, Japanese are so kind that they're not even conscious that they're kind. Mm, door to shelf. Um, if you see, how, how many times do you see someone helping a struggling mum with her baby car um, in the Chikatetsu, for example? So one of the interesting arguments is that actually in societies that have a whole range of intervening organizations, whether it's companies, whether it's the Chon AK, you know, it's a, um, a whole bunch of organizations. Caring for other people becomes kind of someone else's responsibility. Um, there is an assumption that other people will look after them, family will look after them or whatever. It's kind of, I don't need to do it. Whereas in a place like Iraq, that is just so clearly broken um, as a society, it is abundantly clear, if I don't help this person, no one is going to help them. And so this may help to explain why many societies that otherwise lack a lot of what we understand in community in terms of social structures, institutionalized, may actually have higher levels of kindness, okay? Um, what's interesting is what saves Japan from being right at the bottom on the World Giving Index is the number of people who say they volunteer their time. But when you look at the statistics, it's a lot of that kind of shogunai kind of volunteering. You've got to go to the chonaikai. You've got to go to the P and C and whatnot né? Um, of the school because jimbani, everybody's got to do it. That actually on things like donations to charity and whatnot. And what is inescapable about America with a voluntarist tradition is yes, Japan as America has a um, very poor social welfare system but it has some of the most generous people in the world in terms of donation to charity. And so many things, cultural institutions and whatnot are funded um, by donations. So just, I wanna finish with this final comparison. I'll pick up with a couple more um, next class. But I just wanna highlight how there's often a disconnect between the stories we tell ourselves about societies and reality. Um, for decades, Westerners thought that Japan got rich by exports, shrink, um, suppressing domestic demand focused on exports. Um, that's pretty much a good description of what actually happened in the Korean case. Yet, uh, the reality is actually very different. If you ask many Japanese and many non-Japanese, which country in Europe economically is most like Japan? Overwhelmingly, people say Germany. But let's have a look at a basic thing. Percentage of um, GDP accounted for by exports. What do we see? Um, Japan uh, here, 14.73%. Only about one eighth of the Japanese economy, well, it's a rough number, um, one seven, um, is exports. Germany, half, okay? So Germany is massively dependent and has doubled its dependence over time on exports, overwhelmingly because of the EU. And keep this in mind, when Germans complain about profligate um, EU and paying for the bill and the, you know, the Greeks who want to lie in the sun and don't pay taxes and indebtedness and everything, overwhelmingly German companies have prospered because of the EU. And they're also doing pretty well in terms of exports to China and places like that, but still it's relatively small. Whereas Japan, um, even 25 years ago, only 10% of the Japanese economy was exports. And although it's 50% larger, it's still only 14.75%. To put that in perspective, Australia is more export oriented and pretty much any country you look down the list is more export oriented other than the USA. So Italy, um, UK, for example, um, even India is much more dependent on exports than Japan. And this, and this is where I want to finish today, helps to understand, helps us to understand what seems to be a basic paradox about Japan. Japan has some world-class companies, 
really hugely respected um, companies like Toyota and, you know, and so many different fields, Nintendo, Nikon, so many of these amazing companies. And yet Japan for the last 25 years has had an average growth rate of 0.7%. How do we square those two things? Well, the, the implications are quite simple. The domestic Japanese economy has been in a bad way for a long time and the domestic Japanese economy is the larger part of the economy. Exports are actually not very important to Japan. Um, here's the fantastic news for yourselves. You guys um, are in really big demand by that international part of the Japanese economy. You're bilingual, you're cross-cultural. So you get to work in the really dynamic part of Japan and earn income while actually capturing the benefits of the underperforming bad part of Japan, okay? Um, that's why you can go to Onjuku in Chiba and for Hyakuman, you can buy a 40 square meter apartment in front of the beach, okay? Which will be the, you know, with one bonus when you go to work for a company and get a bit advanced in with your salary, you will be able to buy yourself a beach apartment, okay? You can um, buy yourself an apartment in a ski field. Now, this makes Japan an extraordinarily strange place where the domestic economy is suffering long-term deflation. Um, while you're only making money in the domestic economy, it kind of balances out. But if you can get to play internationally and earn internationally and um, take advantage of domestic deflation, you're actually in a really strong position. So the kind of takeaway lesson in relation to our, our survey results yesterday, you should be worried about Corona um, because of the implications for the global economy and what it means for export oriented companies. Fortunately, many of those Japanese companies have been profitable for a long time and they're sitting on a lot of cash so they can continue to hire Shinsotsu. Um, when we talk about HR systems and whatnot, also we'll realize, as some of you already know, doing job hunting, that actually Shinsotsu Sayo new employees are really badly paid uh, relative to Oyaji in Japan, um, which actually means the new employees are relatively cheap. So the kind of takeaway lesson here is go to work for a Japanese export-oriented company, um, and uh, make the most of a Japan base. And although the overall outlook for Japan is statistically pretty depressing, um, you can be in the minority of people who are in an incredibly strong relative position. And that's why um, data can sometimes be very, very comforting or very disconcerting if it, you're not in the, uh, in the driver's seat, as we would say, as you are here. Okay, um, I'll stop there. Um, technically, this is exactly the finishing time, although some of you mentally think that um, uh, Nigen finishes at noon, it actually is 10 past. Okay, um, we will have another live session uh, next Wednesday, and I'll be talking uh, actually about the history of market systems, uh, putting it in a historical context, and then will that lead into our discussion of market systems as a whole. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll have the broad context set up. And then from the following week, we'll have uh, video on demand on uh, Wednesday slot. And uh, then we'll, and you'll have a quiz then. And uh, you will have a live session then every Thursday subsequently. Um, most importantly is get a copy of the textbook and get to work on it, okay? And you can get that uh, quite cheaply as a um, uh, Kindle one or you can come to campus or you can go to um, any of the bookshops, um, Maruzen, for example, Maranuchi, uh, last time I was in there quite recently, uh, they have them, I was a building there straight across the street, Kinokuniya and Shinjuku um, can get it, I don't know if they've got a copy now, um, and you can, you can get it online. But actually I suggest the Kindle version is super easy to have, if you've got a big enough smartphone, you can even read it on your phone. So thanks very much. Um, hope this first week has gone smoothly for you and uh, enjoy the weekend and look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Um, I'll hang around for a bit if anyone's got questions on anything. I've got um, some time because I then only have a class um, in period three. So thank you very much, folks. So bye.